Hey guys, Pastor Jurgen here. I'm so glad you're tuning into one of our powerful messages that is guaranteed to absolutely elevate your life to another level. At Awaken, we only want to preach fresh, real, powerful to help you grow stronger in your walk with God, develop your faith so you can take more territory. I'm praying that God blesses you and enriches your soul as you listen to this amazing word from God. God bless you. I want to talk to you on a theme that I believe is it's personal for you. Everybody say me. It's personal for you. In fact, here's, here's what it is. Look at somebody and tell them this. Say, you're anointed. All right. Now, now will you turn to your second choice and tell them? You love them too, right? Tell them you're anointed. Now, now since we're all figuring that out, everybody say this with me. Say, I'm anointed. Did you know that you have been anointed by God? And I want to talk to you about that anointing. You know, we're in this series where you guys are talking about freedom. And we know that the anointing breaks the yoke of bondage. If you want to find freedom in your life, you need more of God's anointing. So I want to read a verse to you. It's, it's found in 1 John. And before we read the verse, we're going to read it and we're going to pray. I heard a story about this atheist that was in the woods. He was walking along. A bear comes out and starts chasing him. And as he's running away from the bear, he kind of gets scared. He turns around and he trips and falls. The bear runs over him, raises its paw, and is about you know, to attack him. When without realizing it, the atheist screams out and says, God, save me. Suddenly everything freezes and he hears the voice from heaven. It's God. God says, all these years you denied that I exist. And now at the last moment when you're about to die, you call out to me to make you a Christian. The, the atheist said, you know, God, that's a really good point. It's probably not fair of me to do that. But how about this? Could you at least make the bear a Christian? <laughs> Suddenly to his amazement, everything unfreezes. Right? The, the, the river starts going down. The, the birds start flying again. He doesn't hear the voice anymore. And to his amazement, the bear takes its paw, its paw and drops it to its side. He breathes a sigh of relief. And then the bear puts its paws together and says, Dear Lord, bless this food that I'm about to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Yeah, yeah. Prayed a little prayer there. We're going to pray a prayer over this, over this service. And this sermon. But before I do, I want to read this to you. Here's what it says. 1 John 2.20. 2, but you have an anointing from the Holy One. As for you, the anointing you receive from him remains in you. Somebody say, I'm anointed. Close your eyes. Those joining us online, wherever you are. Holy Spirit, help. And everybody said amen. I mean, no, you don't need long prayers. God hears you wherever you are. I want to talk to you today about the anointing. Now, what is the anointing? In the Old Testament, they had what's called the anointing oil. And they would take this oil and they would pour it on the head of someone that was being set aside for a purpose, like a king or a priest. They put the oil on them and what it signified was a few things. Number one, that they were being set aside to do something. Secondly, the anointing represented the fact that God's spirit was now upon them for the purpose of accomplishing this. So when we think of the anointing, now we think of the Holy Spirit. And by the way, you have the anointing because you realize that Jesus Christ is not his first and last name. Jesus is his name. Um, Christ is a word which in the Bible means the anointed one. So when you receive Christ, you receive the anointing. So we receive the anointing. Now, why do we have it? Well, here's what's interesting. God has anointed you, and here's why. Just like that Old Testament oil, he's anointed you so that you can have God's authority, God's power, and God's favor to fulfill your assignment in life. So if you own a business, or you're a mom, or, or you are a teacher in a school, or you, you maybe are involved in firefighting or police work, or whatever you do in life, God has assigned you, God has appointed you, and here's the good news, if he's appointed you, he's anointed you, which means he gives you the authority and the power to accomplish what you're supposed to do. So what I want to do today is I want to take up a story in the Bible about someone who was anointed, and I want to draw some, some principles out of that story that apply to you and I in our life, because all of us have an assignment. And I'm going to talk about David. 
There's a story where basically the prophet Samuel said, said this. God spoke to him and said, go to Jesse's house. Jesse's got a bunch of sons. I'm going to show you one of them, and you're going to anoint him to be the next king. So he shows up. What's interesting, he eventually anoints David, and this is what the Bible says happens to David the moment that he's anointed. 1 Samuel 16, 13 says, And the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. How many want to walk under God's powerful grace, favor, and anointing? Well, we're going to learn some ways to do that. So I'm going to give you a few thoughts today. If you're taking notes, write this down. Point number one, if you want to walk in your anointing at its greatest level, Write this down if you're taking notes. If you're not taking notes, write this down. Okay, here we go. Ready? (laughs) Say this. Say, you don't have to be visible to be valuable. You don't have to be visible to be valuable. Here's what's interesting. Samuel shows up, and what does he do? He says, I want to anoint the, I want to see your sons, because I'm going to anoint one of them. But Jesse brought all of his sons except for David. David was out with the sheep, taking care of the sheep. His dad didn't see the anointing on his life. His mom didn't see the anointing on his life. His brothers, can I stop and say, there are people here right now that you don't realize you're anointed, or maybe people don't see what God sees on you. But God has put something on you. He's out in the field, and so they go through, and they start seeing all the sons, and as they go by, finally... um, God says, none of these are the one. So the Bible says this, then Samuel asked and said, are all of these the sons you have? They're still the youngest, Jesse replied. Send for him at once, Samuel said. We will not sit down to eat until he arrives. I I love that. I love that. He says, listen, we're stopping the party until David shows up. Now let let me pause that for a minute and we'll jump back into it. Because I want to I want to point something out. How many here um, at Halloween? You know, Halloween's right around the corner. And when you're little, you would go out and you'd get candy. How many everybody seen uh, Jerry Seinfeld get candy, get candy, get candy, right? It's like when you're young, it's all about getting candy. And I don't know about you, but when I was young, like we were old school. We didn't have all the nice, you know, little bags. We had the pillowcase. How many use the pillowcase? <laughs> candy don't take taste like candy unless it comes out of a pillowcase. Come on. And so you'd go out and you'd get your candy and fill it up, right? And then the, if you had brothers, you're like smacking each other with the pillowcase full of candy. What happened? You get home, and when you got home, everybody would dump out their pillowcase to try to prove they had gotten the most candy. And then what did you do? You immediately started separating the good candy from the yucky candy, right? And then they would take all the yucky candy, you'd give it to mom, she'd put it in a bowl, and it would go on the table in the, in the, the kitchen, But what would you do with all the good candy? Come on, how many know what the good candy is? Snickers, come on, do we have anybody? Or or Reese's Cups, come on, right there. You know, they serve those in heaven, by the way. I don't know if you know that. And um, and so what would you do? You'd take all the good candy, you would take it back to your room, and you would hide it. Right? Anybody hide candy? Why? Because you didn't want your brothers or your sister or anyone to come and take your candy. So you thought you were good, but then when you'd go to school, your parents would sneak in and steal your candy. How many, how many parents have taken their kids' candy, the good stuff? Not from the bowl, right? Some of you are like flashing back right now having PTSD, right? Here's the point. The good stuff is always hidden. That's why it's called hidden treasure, And can I pause and say, just because you're not seen, just because you're not visible, doesn't mean you're not valuable. Can I tell you that if God has to, he will stop the party and let no one eat anything until he calls you from the sheep field. You might be here today, you might be joining us online, and you feel like, God, do you even know what's going on in my life? Do you know how hard I'm working? Do you know the gifts and talents you put in me? And sometimes we feel like God's forgotten us. But can I tell you something? God has not forgotten you. He sees you. He knows you. He loves you. And when it's time for you to go to the next level, He'll stop the party. He'll call your name and you'll have a placemat. You'll have a chair. You'll have everything you need to step into his blessing for your life. Come on, amen. amen. Preach it, Pastor Jared, amen. Word. So good. 
We got a new one in our church. They go, true. Amen. I'll never forget, I was working at a, at a church, and it was a church of about 80 people. I was a, a school teacher. I taught in public schools, and I did worship and youth at my dad's church. And I always knew that I had this calling on my life in the area of worship and other things. And I, so I just poured myself into what I was doing. There was a church in Northern California at the time, Pastor Boom Boom Berto, the house in Modesto. And uh, this massive church, they just experienced a revival. They brought in Heaven's Gates and Hell's Flames, this drama. They had 33,000 salvations in 28 nights. This, it was amazing what God was doing there. And the church was exploding, it was growing, and so they needed a, a person to oversee worship. And so they began bringing in all of the biggest names at that time in, and they were interviewing them, and they were talking to them. And, and you know, but it just so happened. How many know that, that you don't have to have the biggest following on social media? It just so happened that my, my uh, sister-in-law's dad was on the board of that church. And they kept bringing people in. It just wasn't the right fit, and it wasn't the right fit, and, or people didn't want the job. And, and, and so... Next thing I know, my phone rings. And I'm here at a church of, you know, really small. I'm working, you know, bivocational, working in another place. You know, no one would ever think of this little guy out in the middle of a field with just a few sheep. It's easy sometimes to think, God, you don't even know what's going on in my life. And the devil tells you what you're doing is insignificant. The devil tells you what you're doing doesn't really matter. But aren't you thankful that you don't have to be visible to be valuable in the eyes of the Lord? The next thing I know, I get a phone call, and guess who gets the job? God brought me out of that little field taking care of what he'd called me to, and he put me in a position where I was able to then do even more. And let me just tell you, no matter where you are in life, God sees you today, and you need to know that you're anointed. He has called you. You've been appointed. Don't give up because maybe you haven't gotten that call. You don't have to go on social media and build your brand. You don't have to, to get on there and get the right social media marketer. Listen, God sees us he has a call for us and here's what we know he's confident that what he started he will complete until the day of Jesus Christ amen here's the second thought second thought is this in fact let me just make one one statement so many times we we work so hard if we can just be seen don't waste your time auditioning for a part that God has already given you number two you don't need a better assignment to have a greater anointing. You don't need a better assignment to have a greater anointing. I want you to see what happened. He anoints him. Says, so Jesse sent for him. He was dark and handsome with beautiful eyes. And the Lord said, this is the one. Anoint him. So as David stood there among his brothers, Samuel took the flask of oil. He had brought and anointed David with the oil. And the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day. Then, this is the little part that we read through and just skip on by, but don't realize its significance. It says, then David, or then Samuel returned to Ramah. Here's what didn't happen. He anointed him, and then he said, okay, David, come with me. You're going to come back to Ramah, which is the center of the nation for prophetic ministry, and I'm going to raise you up, and everyone's going to start knowing your name. No, it says that Samuel went back to Ramah, and where did David go? Back out into the field. Sometimes we think, well, no, if God's called greatness out of me, I feel like this company could be so much bigger and I could give to the kingdom and I could create legacy wealth for my family. So we start seeing these things, these bigger things. And, and here's the problem. The minute we start to see the bigger thing, we start thinking we have to leave the now so that we can start pursuing the next. But I want to tell you something. He didn't leave his now. He didn't have to have a bigger assignment to have a greater anointing. The Bible says he went right back into the sheep field and he kept being faithful in his now. Let me show you something because that's important. Because the Bible says in Psalm chapter 78, this is powerful. It tells us about David as a king later on. It says he chose David as servant and took him from the sheep pens. From tending the sheep. He brought him to the to shepherd of his people, Jacob, of Israel, his inheritance. And David shepherded them with the integrity of their, his heart, and with a skillful hand, he led them. You see, the reality is that oftentimes in this process of walking out the calling and the assignment in life, is that we start thinking about the next so much that we uh, devalue the now. Stay in your now. Do you know that David, he needed to be a great shepherd? 
Because the Bible says he shepherded Israel. And but what we want to do is we want to focus on throwing the rocks. But no, God said, I need you to be a better shepherd. So just stay in the assignment. Because here's the point. How can God empower you to do something you're trying to escape from? And so we run from the thing that God has asked us to do. I'll never forget one day I was praying and when I moved to Modesto and started overseeing the worship ministry and I felt like I had so much in my heart to do albums and to teach people on worship and to, to, to travel the world and, and be a part of raising up that ministry there. And, and I'll never forget one day I was praying in the prayer chapel and I read in Psalm chapter two where it says this, it says, ask of me and I will give you the nations. Ask of me, I will give you the ends of the earth for your inheritance. And it's a messianic passage about Christ. And I remember reading it. And as soon as I finished reading it, the Holy Spirit stopped me and said, go ahead. And I'm like, go ahead what? He said, go ahead and ask me. And then I got theological with God. Have you ever done that? I'm like, God, that's really cool and everything. But you know that what this message is talking about. The context here is Christology with the coming of the Messiah. And he said, yeah, yeah, I know all that. But now it's a rhema word for you. So if you, ha this is literally said, if you have the guts, go ahead and ask me. And so I stopped and I prayed. I said, Lord, that's a big prayer, but I ask of you that you'd give me the nations. I pray that you'd give me the ends of the earth for your possession, for your kingdom. But you know what? I felt a call. I felt an anointing like God had more. But you know what I didn't do? I didn't walk out of the prayer chapel, go upstairs to Pastor Berto and say, hey, I'm going to quit. By the way, here's my new missionary card that I want to give you because I'm going to the nations. No, you know what I did? I went straight back into the choir room and started rehearsing the choir. And then I went straight back into the, the, the meeting and started working with my leadership team. Sometimes we think, well, if I can just go be like them or if I can just go over there. Listen, stay in the middle of your now. You don't need a bigger assignment to have a greater anointing. You have the anointing you need to be the dad, to be the mom, to be the husband, to be the wife, to, to be the light in your neighborhood. You have what you need. If you've been appointed, you've been anointed. Somebody say, I'm anointed. Here's the third one. Write this down if you're taking notes. Keep playing the harp. It kind of rolls right in. It's, it's a similar thought, but I have to stop and point this out to you. Keep playing the harp. Some are like, well, that doesn't really relate, Pastor. I don't play the harp. <laughs> Speaking metaphorically right now, keep playing the harp. Look what it says. So, so what happened is now the, the, the spirit of God that was on Saul, who was king, because of his bad decisions and his jealousy and all these things, left him. And so now he's getting oppressed by the enemy. And so they say to each other, his, his assistants, they're like, you know what we need to do is we need to bring someone in that can worship and play music because when they worship the Lord, it'll, it'll cause that spirit to, to, to lift. That's why when you come, Pastor Matt was talking about, you come into an atmosphere of worship and we begin to worship him. What does the Bible say? Where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. In his presence is fullness of joy. You get in the presence of God and start to worship things that are holding you down, things that are oppressing you start to lift off of you because there's freedom in his presence. So they're, they're trying to figure out what they're gonna do. And one of the guys says, oh, I know. First Samuel chapter 16 one of Jesse's sons from Bethlehem is a talented harp player. And not only that, he is a brave warrior and the Lord is with him. Now, let me just stop right there. That is one sentence that you normally don't hear. Man, that guy can play the harp. And he is an incredibly powerful warrior. I mean, usually those two don't go together. But, but he's a mighty warrior. He plays the harp. Why am, I, why am I bringing this up? Well, they bring him in, and he starts playing the harp. Can I just this make a point? Don't sell your harp on Facebook Marketplace. What are the gifts and talents God has called you to? Keep on using them. Keep on doing them. What does the Bible say? Be not weary in doing good, for in due season you'll reap if you don't give up. Keep on being faithful. Keep on giving. Keep on serving. Keep on showing up and playing your instrument. Keep on sharing the faith with the people in your neighborhood. Never underestimate the power of playing your harp. Never underestimate the power of faithfulness. Here's why. The reason that David defeated Goliath is not because he was good with a slingshot. It was because he played the harp. 
why would King Saul put the entire nation in the hands of a 16-year-old kid? Because if he lost, they were going to surrender to the Philistines. Why would he do it? Here's why. Because he knew the power, he knew the anointing that was on David because David played the harp when he was oppressed. And so he'd be in his bedroom and he'd be struggling and David would come in and start playing. Now imagine if David's hitting bad notes. Imagine if he's off key. It wasn't that. He came in, he was anointed, and he began to play. And the spirit and the anointing on his life was recognized by King Saul. And because he recognized that power, when another opportunity showed up, guess what? He said, hey, you were anointed before, you're anointed now, you'll be anointed tomorrow. So can I tell you, wherever you are in life, keep on playing your harp, keep on doing what God's called you to do, and one day you just might be in front of a giant that'll fall to the ground. Why? Because you are anointed. Somebody say, I'm anointed. <laughs> Not I'm annoying, I'm anointed. It was a good one. I'm going to use that. It was a little annoying for me, but it was, I'm not anointed. It was, yeah, no, no, it was so good. Never underestimate. Here's, here's the next one. We're going to get there. Next one is this. If you want to walk in that anointing, that God has called you and, and step into everything God has for you. Because man, I, don't, here, I know I'm going off, off ter- a topic for a second, but my greatest fear is that I'm going to get to heaven. And God's not going to be able to stick a fork in me and say, well done. But what's going to happen is I'm going to get to heaven and I'm like, God, I gave him my best shot. And he's like, great job. Thank you for your passion. And he's like, look at all of this. And then he goes... But let me show you what door number B, what could have happened if you stepped up into the anointing that I called you to. I don't want to be medium rare. I don't want to be, I want to be well done. I want to step into every, what does he say? I can do exceedingly abundantly above what you ask, dream, or imagine according to my anointing, my power that's working in you. Some of us just need to start dreaming a little bigger. Some of us need to just start seeing our situations and realizing that God has positioned you, he has placed you, and he has not only appointed you, he has anointed you with what you need to succeed in the calling and the assignment that you have in life. Maybe your marriage is struggling, you think, I'm just not a good husband. I destroy that lie of the enemy in Jesus' name. He put you there, he appointed you, and he's anointed you to tear down some giants and to see some victory. Say, I'm anointed. Okay, I got to keep going. Here we go. Here's, Here's the next one. Get comfortable in your armor. Get comfortable in your own armor. So Saul says, okay, bro, you, I see God's favor on your life. So I'm going to let you go for this. But here's the, here's the deal. Dude, you need some good weapons. You need the latest technology. So here's my sword. Take this sword. Here's, you know, the armor. I've got the best armor in the, in the nation. Take, take this helmet. Take this shield. Try it on. So, so here's what it says. Then Saul gave David his own armor. David put it on. And he goes, and he said what I think, if, you, if, you ever been, if you're married, you probably have heard your wife say this. He said, I can't go in these. Okay, sorry. David put it on. He said, I can't wear this. He protested to Saul. So David took them off again. And then he picked up five smooth stones, everybody say smooth stones, from a stream and put them into his shepherd's bag. Then armed only with his shepherd's staff and sling, he started across the valley. What I love is that he decided, I can't go to warfare. I can't be anointed and try to wear somebody else's armor. I need to be me. I'll never forget when I first started in ministry and I was learning how to speak. I, you know, I would see these great speakers and, and you know, back in my day when I was young, it was like a T.D. Jakes. I mean, T.D. Jakes knew how to preach the word and, and you know, he'd get up there and he'd start preaching and he had this one message where he was like, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. And he would say it and he would sweat because, you know, the anointing was so strong, it was just coming out of his pores and He'd have someone following behind him with a towel just to help wipe the sweat down. And so I'm like, hey, you're going to be my towel guy. And, you know, and I'm like, you grab the towel. And I'm like, get ready, get ready. And for some reason, it just didn't come across the same. Because here's the problem. I was wearing someone's armor. 
I wasn't comfortable in my own skin. Can I say this? The anointing won't empower you to fulfill somebody else's assignment. You can look at Pastor Matt. I mean, how, how funny and hilarious is this guy? He's so creative and got a, a revelation from the Lord. And, you know, I mean, it's incredible. Pastor Jurgen, he's such a great communicator. I mean, when I first heard him, like, afterwards, I'm, I'm like, tempted thinking, I got to work on my accents and stuff. Because this guy is like, I'm just convinced if I had an Australian accent, we'd reach three or 400 more people every weekend for Jesus. And, you know, and then I got to work on that English accent of that, the old lady, like Mrs. Doubtfire. And, and I'm like, I'm, I, and, and the next thing you know, you're trying to put on somebody else's armor. And I want to tell you something. You don't have to be like the other dad in your friend group. You don't have to be like the other guy who owns a business in that center that you work in. God has given you what you need. You're anointed. Greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. World, get comfortable in your own armor. Come on, somebody say I'm anointed. Here's why. Let me let me let me keep going here real quick. So there's three types of soldiers in that day. One soldier was a Calvary, uh, the Calvary men, and that was that they would ride um, horses into battle. And then you had what was called the armed armed combat infantry, and they would carry their spears and swords, and they would fight hand to hand in combat. And then you had the third, which was the archers or the slingshot guys. They were called slingers. Here's what's crazy. I'm going to just make a statement. Had David fought with the sword, he would have lost the battle. Let me tell you why. Because his enemy was a giant named Goliath who had never lost a battle with a sword. And here's what a lot of commentators, theologians believe, that his eight-foot height that he had wasn't, you know, just some supernatural thing. He had a disease that caused his body to keep growing. And so it made this whole genetic race of people grow to be big people. But one of the problems, one of the consequences or of that was that it affected other things. And his, probably his issue was from that disease is that he had an issue with his sight. So he couldn't see far away. He could only see close up. What would that be called? Nearsighted or farsighted? I, every time I ask that question, it's like a 50-50. Everybody's. <laughs> Obviously, you're not anointed to know the answer to that question. Um, here's the point. Because he stood at a distance and he used a sling, he put the en enemy at a disadvantage. Had he fought in someone else's armor, the enemy would have had the advantage. And I just wonder how many people are losing battles, backing up, losing ground, because they're still trying to walk in somebody else's anointing, somebody else's calling. Listen, just get comfortable with who you are. God has anointed you, and he will put you in a position where you can keep the enemy at, at his back, off of his heels. Stay true. Get comfortable. Here, here's the other thing. I'll say this, and then we'll bring it to a close. The last point. It says that he didn't go into the battle with a sword, but he went into the battle with um, a smooth stone. And he also went into the battle with a staff, which I, the Lord showed me recently. I have a whole sermon on why he took a staff into the battle. Because here's the interesting thing. He never used the staff in the battle. So why would he even take it there? And if you look at his life in the past, when he talked about the bear and the lion that he defeated, every time he talked about it, he used the staff. And now he's in a new battle, and he's using the stone. I'll just point this out, is that because sometimes when you have a new enemy, God has to give you a new strategy. And he walks into the battle, and when he walks into the battle, he grabs a smooth stone. Why would he grab a smooth stone? Well, if you've ever used a smooth stone and, and you try to skip it across, a uh, across the water, it works way better. It flies straighter. He needed a smooth stone so he could hit his target. But here's the thing that we don't realize, is that that stone didn't just become a smooth stone overnight. Because here's what we know, that that valley had had a river flowing through it at some point. Because the river then took all these jagged rocks over a year, 
uh, you know, decades, maybe even centuries, maybe even over a thousand years, it took time for that stone to be smoothed by the water that came through, meaning that God knew that David was going to have a battle before David ever knew that he was going to have a battle. And he was so ready and so excited to give him a weapon to defeat his enemy that thousands of years before David ever got there, he put the stone there, he sent the river there. And can I tell you, you may be in the middle of the biggest battle of your life, but God has already placed a stone there. He's already positioned victory for you. He's already put you in a position to see the breakthrough so the giants fall, so that the enemy flees, so that you can take territory. God has armed you, but don't grab David or the Saul's sword. Get comfortable in your own armor. Come on, look at somebody and say, you be you. Okay, here's the last one. Y'all still with me? Say amen. All right, I'm going to try to land this plane. Um, I need to go quick. I just need a couple more minutes. Can I have a couple more minutes? All right. How many give me two more minutes? Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. We got all day. Okay, so here we go. Just kidding. Here's the last point. Finish the job. Some of you are like, well, what do you mean, finish the job? I thought he threw the stone and knocked him down. How many know that if you read the story, he didn't just knock him down, but he eventually cut off his head. And how many know that there's some things in life we can knock down but not, not defeat? How many know there's some battles we can win but lose the war? So he throws the stone. Look at what it says. It says, so David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone, for he had no sword. Then David ran over, pulled Goliath's sword from its sheath. David used it to kill him and cut off his head. And it was when he cut off his head, when he finished the job, the Philistines saw their champion was dead. They turned and they ran. Then the men of Israel rose up, gave a shout of triumph and rushed after the enemy. All of these godly people were frozen in fear, even when the giant fell. But what turned the battle was when they finished the job. I want to just say, because it's getting heavy here. Some of you have let Goliath get back on his feet way too many times. And it's time to run. Some of you, you've been struggling with addiction for 25 years. It's time to grab the sword, cut off his head, and finish the job. You've been struggling in your marriage for five years. It's time to go see a pastor. It's time to get into counseling. It's time to have someone lay their hands on you. It's time to get, it's time to finish the job. You know why? Because there is an army of people watching you. Sons and daughters, siblings, coworkers that are looking for someone who will finish the job and when they do what happens something inside of them stirs the anointing where they realize wait a minute I can defeat a Philistine too wait a minute I can see a breakthrough in my marriage too wait a minute I can be free too wait a minute I can walk in the blessing of God and see my business grow and provide for my family and for the kingdom wait a minute I can stand I can fight I can see victory listen people are waiting on you it's time to step into your anointing and finish the job. The other thing about this is that the sword wasn't Saul's. Why, why does God not want us to use somebody else's gifts? Because he wants to use the devil's weapon. What the devil meant for harm, God has turned for good. He picked up the enemy's sword and he used it against him. That's why our mess becomes his message. That's why our test becomes a testimony. 
because he takes the broken places and the challenging places. So listen, you're here and you feel unworthy and you feel like God can never use you and you feel like it'll never change. I'm telling you, you're in perfect position today because God has already put a stone in the field for you. There's already a sword waiting. Victory can be yours. He'll turn the enemy's weapon against him. I want to tell this story as I end. I didn't share it last service, but um, COVID was a crazy time for us, just like here. I know you guys went through a lot. I appreciate the strength of your pastor for standing up and certain things. And we were in LA County, which was a lot more restrictive than even this county. But I'll never forget, um, it was the end of 2020. Yeah, end of 2020. And um, I get a phone call from a ministry. His name is Sean Foyt. And he was traveling around singing and, and doing outdoor worship gatherings. And he said, hey, they won't let us do our, it was a, a they were going to go to Azusa and do kind of this incredible night of worship to end 2020 worshiping at midnight and start 2021 worshiping. Share the gospel and start a new beginning. And they were going to do it outside. And so they called and said, you know, we can't do it in L.A., but you have this big parking lot. Would you be willing to host it and let us come? And so I prayed about it and, and uh, felt like it was what we we're supposed to do. So I said, come on, let's do it. And um, then the word got out. And all hell break, broke loose. How many have ever had all hell break loose? We started getting a death threats. People started giving death threats to my children. The city came against us. The local business came against us. And there was this one news organization that basically posted it, and it became kind of the place where I forget how many thousands, like 15, 20,000 comments, people just blasting us. And, and all we were doing is doing what was happening already. People were going outside, and we were going to worship God. And, and um. And the crazy thing, I'll tell you right now that I haven't really said this ever publicly, but while this was all happening, I had COVID. And my wife had COVID. And my whole family was in quarantine. And we were having it rough. I, I think I had went 18 days. And so I was getting calls from CNN, from Fox News, from people were showing up. And um, basically they started talking about our church. We had some people got upset and left and it was like it was just this really difficult season but I'm like you know what there's nothing wrong with gathering of course we encourage people to be wise and maybe if they needed to quarantine just be smart whatever it would that look like for them as a personal decision but man they came after us hard but we did it anyway and I didn't even get to go and nobody knew I was sick because I didn't want that to be part of the story too I literally had people calling me and say, you're going to kill people. And Well, first of all, let me give you a little testimony. That night, 8,000 people showed up, and almost 800 people gave their lives to Jesus Christ that night. So we, we went forward. There was a lot of backlash, but we just went forward and did what the Lord said. And um, that organization that rose up against us, man, they didn't like us. People didn't like us. But you know what we did? We kind of felt like for us, the way the Lord wanted us to go through this process was to be like Daniel. Is just get in our room and pray. And just do the right thing. Don't be disrespectful. Be loving to people. But just do what God said to do. We did. What's crazy is... After it was all done, the same organization that blasted us, that we got death threats through, ended up coming back to us and saying, hey, um, we don't have any place to do our big food truck gatherings. And you got a big parking lot. Would you be open to let us do a, a, a food truck event in your parking lot every Thursday night? So I grabbed the sword. I said, let's go. And suddenly, 2,000 people every Thursday night started to show up in our parking lot from all over the valley. 
then we started talking. He said, hey, what if we did an event at Christmas and we focused on, you know, just families coming together, but we had a prayer tent and, it was, you know, it's about you know, Christmas and coming together. And he said, well, we'll do it with you. And the next thing you know, they start promoting our church on the same website that had come against us. We, we had the event and the event was so big that the police department had to come out over 8,500 people showed up in our parking lot to come and celebrate Christmas and gather together again. And now we're in partnership. We're about to do it again. We're doing two nights expecting like 12 to 15,000 people. Listen, sometimes God will take what the enemy meant for harm and he'll do it for good. If you just stay locked in on your anointing, if you just keep doing what God's called you to do, if you just keep saying, God, I know you've appointed me. So if you've appointed me, God, you have anointed me. Somebody say I'm anointed. Mom, you're anointed. Dad, you're anointed. There's an anointing in this room right now, and I'm going to pray over you. Before I pray, though, I want you to close your eyes, and here's the question. Maybe you're here, maybe you're online, and you've never received the anointing. You say, what do you, what do you mean? Well, if you've never received Jesus, then you've never received the anointing because Jesus is the anointed one. And the Bible says he stands at the door and knocks, and if anyone will open the door and invite him in, you can have the anointing to empower you for your assignment in life. To take you to heaven one day and receive the inheritance of eternal life. So today, if you're here, if you're joining us online and you've never asked Jesus to come into your life, I want to give you a chance to do that right now. Now, here's the problem. Here's the reason why we are not anointed. It's a word called sin. And, and, and the Bible says we all do it. I mean, how many are not perfect? If you're not perfect, wave at me. I know your eyes are supposed to be closed, but wave at me if you're not perfect. Some of you didn't wave. You just proved it right now when you didn't wave. All have sinned. And that's what distances us from God. But if we'll confess our sin and we'll call on Jesus, he'll come into our heart and we'll receive the anointing. He'll forgive our sins. Listen, here's the thing. People come to church and they think it's all about religion and the pastors just want to point at them and say, shame on you, shame on you. No, the good news of the gospel is that Jesus Christ came, died on a cross, and he can come into your heart so that he can say shame off you. He'll get rid of your past. He'll get rid of your mistakes. And you can walk in the divine purpose he has for you. So when I say three, if you want to go to heaven, if you want your sins forgiven, if you want to be anointed, I'm going to ask you to lift your hand. That's why God brought you here today. Maybe you're here and you've prayed a prayer like that before, but you need to recommit your life because you're a prodigal and you're off away from God. It's time to come back and receive a fresh anointing today. So when I say three, you're going to lift your hand high because the Bible says if you'll confess him before men, he'll confess you before his father. So you're ready on the count of three, whether it's the first time or a recommitment, God is going to anoint you. He's going to forgive you. He's going to set you apart to fulfill your assignment. Are you ready? When I say three, lift your hand. One, you can be anointed. Two, all your past can be erased. Right now, where are you? Three, lift your hands right now. Thank you, 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 thank you. Who else? Thank you, thank you. Who else? You say yes, Pastor. Thank you right there. Who else today? You say yes. Thank you, 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 thank you. Thank you over there. Anybody over here say yes, Pastor? Thank you right there. Anybody over here? Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, all right, you can put your hands down. The Bible says, confess your mouth, believe in your heart, and you'll be saved. Say, Jesus, I invite you in. Come into my heart. Forgive me of all my mistakes. I put my faith in you as the anointed one, as a savior of the world. I want to follow you from this day forward. In your name I pray. Now, if you prayed that prayer, they're going to give you some direction of what to do. But before I turn it over to Pastor, I want you, everyone to just reach your hands towards him. Right now, you do it. There's an anointing in this room. Oh, Jesus, thank you for your anointing. Thank you for your anointing. Father, in the name of Jesus, I declare that those that are here today are joining us online and they have felt so inadequate. They have felt like so isolated that you don't see them. 
Lord, in fact, I believe there's somebody in this room that you have been so isolated and so discouraged because of some things and mistakes of life that you literally have been thinking about taking your own life, of why do I even live? Why am I even here? And today God is waking within you an understanding that he loves you. He knew you before you were born. He has a purpose and a plan for your life. And we break that lie of the enemy that you don't need to be here. You have an assignment from heaven and God is gonna use you to make a difference. So whoever you are, we break suicide off of you right now in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, that we're gonna start to see a picture of who you created us to be and what you've called us to. So Father, I pray for all of those that have felt isolated and alone. I thank you that they're starting to see that they don't have to be visible to be valuable because you see them and you're gonna call their name, God, and you're gonna cause them to step into everything you have for them. I pray a fresh anointing, Lord, over moms and dads, over businessmen and businesswomen, I pray a fresh anointing over teachers. I pray a fresh anointing over students. I pray a fresh anointing, Lord, over those that are called to serve and give their gifts to the kingdom of God. Lord, we need your anointing, and the anointing breaks every yoke. So we receive it. Fresh anointing. Fresh anointing. Pastor Matt, Michaela, as you come, I just want to say, I was, I was praying over both of you last night. I was praying over Pastor Jurgen and, and Pastor Le Leanne. I was praying over Awaken. And for some reason, God kept bringing me to San Marcos campus, San Marcos campus. And, and he, he showed me a picture. And I remember, I don't even know what it was, but I, I had a conversation with Pastor Jurgen many years ago. And he was talking about when you were trying to build this place, there was all these challenges and you had to go back in and rebuild like footings and do all of this deep stuff. And um, I just felt like the Holy Spirit said that it was expensive, but there was a reason. Because oftentimes what God does in the natural is a representation of what he's doing in the spiritual. And what I felt like the Lord said is this. I felt like the Lord says that you have a bit of a, of a you, you can disrupt. And you have a gift, especially with men. And I don't even know what your role is other than this location, but you have a gift with men to disrupt and, and shake men loose from things that's holding them back from stepping into better seasons and greater anointing. And God has anointed you for that. He's anointed both of you for that. And in fact, this, this, this is so profound because I, went, I got up in the morning, I started studying the cornerstone of the temple and when they built the cornerstone of the temple, they, they built it all off site. In fact, the, the goal was that they should never hear the sound of a hammer at the temple site. Everything was built off site. But when they created the, the first stone, it, when, it, when they built the rest of it and they brought the cornerstone, it, at first it didn't fit. And so they pushed it over a mountain because it was 500 tons and they didn't need it. And they didn't know what to do with it. And then once they pushed it over the mountain and they started to build, they realized that they had to have it to finish it. So then they went back and they had to somehow with this engineering feat, get it back and put it in place. And that's why when Jesus said the cornerstone that the builders rejected will become the chief cornerstone. And there, as I was thinking about this location, this facility and, and the, the deep you know, things that were done, there's something here in Awakened Church that God is doing in this location, that he's given you the ability to build such, and, and, and I heard someone say that you guys have all these men showing up for prayer, and it's just powerful how many are showing up. It's because of the depth of what God is doing in you to help people get so deep down that it's gonna allow you to be able to shake others loose. Whereas a lot of people, when they, when they try to do that, they shake loose too. And my thing is that the Lord says, just keep going deeper. Don't settle, don't stay where you are, but just keep, keep drilling deeper, keep drilling deeper. Because the deeper you go, the wider the impact, and it's gonna affect men, it's gonna affect families, it's gonna affect legacy, it's gonna affect generations. And I feel like there's like these cool ideas that God's getting ready to unlock to you. There's gonna be ways to take things in the past that never worked and they're gonna suddenly work again and they're gonna fit back in and you're gonna see how that, whoa, why didn't we think of this long ago? There's something about this campus that is gonna disrupt the stronghold of the devil. 
and there's going to be a breakthrough and there's going to be a loosing. Come on, stretch your hands to Pastor Matt and Michaela right now. Father, we pray a special anointing. We pray, Father, that you're releasing a disruptor anointing that is going to help break, Lord, that's going to help break through. Lord, I'm reminded of when David was wanting a, a drink of water from the place in Bethlehem, and, and he, but it was surrounded by enemy. And, and along came Abishai, and he said, we're going to go get you some. And he just broke through the ranks, and he disrupted the enemy, and he got the water, and he brought it back. God, I thank you that he's going to break through ranks. I thank you that this campus is going to see growth. They're going to see, Lord Jesus, a shaking in the San Marcus area. But Lord, this campus is not going to shake and fall apart. It's going to get stronger and stronger, and all the strongholds of the enemy are going to begin to fall down, and they're going to see your kingdom come. And I thank you that ideas, fresh insight, and favor are being released into your heart and the anointing is going to break every single yoke. So fresh, fresh, fresh. Could you hold this microphone? Fresh anointing. Fresh anointing. Over Pastor Michaela, fresh anointing. Fresh anointing from heaven. In Jesus' name. Wow, what an amazing word. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Hey, listen, for more information about our church, go to www.awakenchurch.com or subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't already and download our app. It is amazing. It is chock full of incredible messages, information about upcoming events, and you can even support our ministry if you feel so inclined. We loved having you with us today. We look forward to seeing you again. God bless you. Live a life that is transformative. Bye for now.